Welcome to U.S. Law Shield's live webinar across America. I'm Sam Malone, your host right here in Houston, Texas, America's fourth largest city and a proud member of U.S. Law Shield. Our topic today, coronavirus, your gun rights, what you need to know, what you must know. On this webinar across America, we're going to get the answers to your questions. It's interactive. If you have a question, type it in on the side of your screen there. Because at U.S. Law Shield, when you're a member like I am, you have 24-7 access to the independent program attorneys who can answer your questions. Uh, on the website at uslawshield.com, you'll find the content, uh, much like this, that'll answer your questions, especially right now as America's dealing with the coronavirus. The gun rights in question, well, there's a lot of them. Uh, gun stores are closing. There's states of emergencies. Can I carry? Uh, can the police come in and take a gun away? Can they prevent me from legally carrying and exercising my Second Amendment rights? We have a lot to cover today. I'm glad you're with us. Before we begin, let's get a welcome, a greeting from the CEO of U.S. Law Shield, Peter Hermosa. I'm Peter Hermosa, the CEO of U.S. and Texas Law Shield. I just want to take a moment to let everyone know out there that our Law Shield family here uh, at Houston HQ is well, we are safe, uh, we are healthy. All of our 200 plus employees have been sent to work from home, to work virtually. But uh, rest assured, we are open for business. So you have any needs, any questions, any concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to our member services lines. We are here for you. Uh, also, members out there, rest assured that your 24-7 attorney answered hotline is solid. We are there. We are ready to uh, help you in your time of need. And here in Houston, we've been through floods. We've been through hurricanes. And now this pandemic, and, and at any time that we've been through those things, your attorney answered hotline has always been there. So even in uncertain times, you can be certain that your legal defense for a self-defense program will be here for you. So I hope this message finds you safe and healthy and your family as well. Thank you so much for being a member and a believer in U.S. and Texas Law Shield, and we will be here for you. Thank you so much. God bless everyone. Take care. Thank you, PJ. Uh, let's get right to your questions and the best answers possible from the independent program attorneys of U.S. Law Shield. Edwin Walker, a great source of knowledge on a topic like this, is joining us on our webinar. Mr. Walker, thanks for being with us. Let me ask you, uh, obviously, the big question, uh, are rights, are they in danger? Well, you know, Sam, uh, this is, we really are kind of in an unprecedented time uh, to have a national state of emergency that has been declared because of this virus. Um, you know, as our previous experience has kind of been limited to disasters, in which on the national level, a disaster is different than an emergency. Uh, disasters tend to be natural disasters that we think of, hurricanes, floods, fires, uh, those sorts of things that are localized, even man-made disasters such as explosions or industrial accidents. Uh, those are localized to, you know, communities, cities, uh, and perhaps sometimes even states. Uh, but to have this national emergency, this national emergency is different. And an emergency, like I said, it's a little bit different. Emergencies are designed to uh, take care of things uh, such as this uh, COVID virus. And so there haven't been many national emergencies that have previously been declared that that literally affect every square mile of the country. Um, so most of the, most of the time, these these things are going to be administered by states, and especially wherever it comes to gun laws, uh, there is a distinction between federal and state. States are given a lot more latitude to regulate, uh, but we have had, as an example, specifically with regard to gun rights, uh, what can happen if governments go unchecked. So I would like for the, uh, all the listeners to recall uh, that there was a major hurricane, uh, you know, over you know, 15 years ago called Hurricane Katrina. And when Hurricane Katrina saw, uh, struck the uh, Gulf Coast, uh, we saw a tremendous overreaction from the city of New Orleans, Orleans Parish, and the state of Louisiana, 
with regard to them actually going out and physically disarming people. And this shocked a lot of people uh, because they had never really seen this before. And, of course, there was video. And if you've ever seen the video of these uh, these law-abiding Louisianians being pushed around uh, just simply because they're in possession of a firearm, it was truly shocking. Now, fortunately, in response to that, uh, the U.S. government, the U.S. Congress, did pass a law uh, that puts a limit on the authority of federal officers and federal employees and people working for the federal government in doing this. And if I could have a moment, I'd just like to make people aware of this. So this law does exist on the books, and it is 42 U.S.C. Section 5207. And I'll just read it so we can get, you know, this law, has, it does not get abrogated in a time of emergency. In fact, it's specifically written for times of emergency. And it says, no officer or employee of the United States, including any member of the uniformed services or person operating pursuant to or under the color of federal law or receiving federal funds or under the control of any federal official or providing service to such an officer, employee, or other person, while acting in support of relief from a major disaster or emergency, so that's where we're at, emergency may, uh, one temporarily uh, or permanently seize, authorize the seizure of any firearm from the possession, the possession of which is not prohibited under federal, state, or local law. It also goes on to not require any registration of firearm. It goes on to say that the federal government cannot prohibit the possession of any firearm that's not already prohibited uh, by state or local law, federal, state, or local law, uh, and they cannot prohibit the carrying of firearms. And so the federal government, thankfully, because of the actions of the ridiculous, the ridiculous actions of the city of New Orleans, has this federal law specifically to protect gun rights. And so uh, what we need to make sure is, is that in general, that there are no more laws passed that restrict people's rights to possess, right to carry, or require registration. Because what this law does, it simply states that in times of emergency, the federal government will maintain the status quo and will not create any new firearm, you know, firearm regulation just simply because we're in a state of emergency. And you have... And by the way, independent program attorney Edwin Walker, and you have access to independent program attorneys when you are a member, uslawshield.com forward slash defend. You, you say that, but once again, and I think it was in L.A. County, uh, hey, gun stores can't open during the uh, coronavirus uh, lockdown, so to speak. I think it was the mayor of New Orleans. There'll be no gun sales. So it's very scary to those of us, Mr. Walker, who embrace 2A, who embrace the Second Amendment, to see mayors or county sheriffs act against our interests of self-defense. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And that's why I made the distinction in the very beginning about the difference between federal law and state law. So what I just read to you was federal law. So no federal authority right. can do this. State authorities operate on a different level. State authorities already have the ability to uh, regulate firearms uh, to a greater degree than the federal government has. Um, so that's where, you know, whenever people do get in or have the potential to get in trouble with or worry about their firearms rights, it will come on the state level. Now, just as the federal government responded in 2006 after Hurricane Katrina, and in fact, the state of Texas, which you and I are both in, responded in 2007 saying that state officials, uh, state police cannot disarm people who are otherwise in compliance with the law. Uh, many states have passed these laws. However, some states have not. And it is usually what we like to call the usual suspects. Uh, states that are traditionally against firearms rights. So they already have laws on the books that are very, very restrictive of firearms rights. And now, unfortunately, this corona emergency has given them the authority or has, has given them the power of the auspices authority to overstep that. Uh, now, of course, speaking just about Texas, because that's where we're at, uh, there's been a tremendous debate about whether or not cities and counties can limit the ability to carry. The answer to that is no, they absolutely cannot. Well, can they, all, can they, can they uh, 
instead of that, limit the ability of a gun store uh, to be open and sell firearms and ammunition. And uh, while there's been no specific answer to that, generally it is thought that the answer is no, they cannot. Because uh, gun stores provide an essential service. They provide an essential service not just to assure that people have the right to self-defense. They provide an essential service uh, to pe provide people the means to hunt for food. Uh, they also are the uh, what we would call a core Second Amendment value. And so because of those reasons, uh, we believe that regardless of what a city or county does, uh, that gun stores uh, will be able to stay open as an exercise of an essential service. I'm attorney with U.S. Law Shield and uh, Texas Law Shield. Speaking of guns, America, stick around in two segments. We'll get to the gun store issue during this coronavirus uh, event we're going through across the country. Because, first of all, uh, a lot of stores are running out of semi-automatics. I get emails pretty much every morning. A lot of stores are limiting uh, ammunition. So we'll get to that in about two segments. Uh, Mr. Walker, uh, we here in Texas, well, in, in Houston, have a stay-at-home order. They're not calling it emergency lockdown. They phrased it stay home, stay safe. But you're not supposed to be out unless you have an essential job. Of course, there's many categories from a person who works at a uh, convenience store to a person who works on the Internet to obviously police and fire and, and medical. But stay-at-home orders... Are they enforceable? There's one here where we are. If I just want to go out, want to drive around, want to have a picnic, I'm not bothering anybody, uh, what should I know? What are my rights? Well, you know, this part is really fascinating on kind of a, uh, a very uh, a intellectual level about what can be done. Because like I said at the top of the show, we really are kind of in an unprecedented time because with regard, you know, our experience mostly is with natural disasters. So we've lived through floods, we've lived through fires, we've lived through hurricanes, and the orders, the disaster orders usually accompanying those are evacuation orders. Get out, you know, you have to leave. Uh, this is really kind of a, a, you know, this is, or you can't go back to a certain area. This is really a very unusual order in that they're telling you to stay home. You know, that's where most people enjoy being. So they're saying, stay home. We don't want you out on the streets. We want you gathering in groups of 10 people. And of course, this implicates a whole bunch of constitutional rights, uh, not just the right to bear arms, which fortunately, I want to say again, Thank you to the bad actions of New Orleans because uh, the, you know, there have been put into place statutory protections for our Second Amendment rights um, and because nobody ever thought that there would be an emergency that could abrogate our First Amendment rights. Uh, but if you look at a stay-at-home order, it's restricting where you can go, who you can see, uh, what you can do. Uh, how many people you can do it with, uh, these all implicate a ton of rights. The First Amendment right to free speech, the First Amendment right to assemble. Uh, the, if the police actually start stopping somebody, uh, that implicates a, first, a Fourth Amendment right to, uh, to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. If the police start asking you, you know, do you have a letter that's saying you can travel or do you have some documentation for your essential occupation? Where are you going? Where are you coming from? Where do you live? Where do you work? This is obviously an implication of the of your Fifth Amendment rights to stay silent and not reveal any kind of incriminating information. Um, a lot of these emergency orders have criminal penalties attached to them. Um, they can be, you know, depending upon the circumstance, it could be a felony, might be a misdemeanor, might be a finable offense, might be a civil offense. Uh, but the thing about it is, is that uh, we've never seen anything like this. Most of the people who have been cited in times of, of disasters have been committing some other criminal act. You know, they've been in a place they're not supposed to be because they're looters um, or they're uh, otherwise engaged in bad activity. So it will be very interesting to see if this opens the door, if this allows for the actual citation, arrest, or prosecution of somebody for be doing nothing but merely getting in their car, going to going to a place that the government says they're not supposed to be, gathering in a group of more than 10 people, which 
I, I hopefully don't think that will lead to anybody's arrest, especially in light of the fact that uh, this, this coronavirus outbreak has the very, very unusual circumstance of the local governments actually letting people out of jail. So, of course, it's very counterintuitive that they would want to go around putting people in jail. Now, of course, if this happens, uh, there is going to be a lot of wrangling about civil rights because your constitutional rights don't go away. So even though there's a state of emergency or a state or disaster declaration, you still are in retention of your constitutional rights because it is the existence of our constitutional rights that stand between us and martial law. Edwin, Edwin Walker, independent program attorney. One more question, because first of all, there's so many comments coming in uh, on our uh, webinar tonight across America with U.S. Law Shield coronavirus, coronavirus, what you need to know, what you really must know. I hate to use these two words, but martial law. Um, is it in our future? And what does it mean to those of us who are proud uh, carriers and, and, and those who hold Second Amendment near and dear to our heart? Right. And martial law is a phrase that gets thrown out a lot. And I certainly hope that there is not martial law in our future, because what the, the word martial um, comes from, in which it's, it's not M-A-R-S-H-L-L, -L, it's M-A-R-T-I-L, it comes from military. Basically, what it says is that martial law is the same as military law. And military law exists whenever there is no civilian law. Um, and uh, there have been times in the course of, of American history where martial law has been attempted on a large or small scale. It usually is unsuccessful. Of course, the most, no the, uh, most notorious or most important example of that is during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln uh, authorized the suspension of the right of habeas corpus, in which that's kind of, even though the Constitution doesn't mention martial law, it doesn't provide for martial law, in fact, that entire document is written in response to, it is a reaction to martial law. Basically, the founders said, we will never have martial law. Um, but they did provide for the suspension of habeas corpus, which is, in a sense, the main purpose of martial law, basically the holding of an individual without charges or the holding of an individual without their ability to go to court to emphasize their rights. And uh, basically, uh, Abraham Lincoln suspended the right of habeas corpus for people he suspected of being rebel collaborators uh, or being in, uh, being, in, you know, uh, being in defiance of the union. And so uh, he actually held people and prosecuted them, and there was actually a person sentenced to death for that, and it came about in a case called, a Supreme Court case, they actually reviewed it in a case called Ex Parte Milligan, where the Supreme Court very emphatically said that as long as the courts are open, and I'm not talking about open as in they're maintaining their regular nine to five hours, but that they are open, they have not been disbanded, they have not been dissolved that as long as the courts are open, martial law cannot exist in the United States. Um, and in fact, they go on to say that, that the existence of martial law is completely at odds and antithetical to our system of constitutional rights. And so, uh, so it would be, you know, I, I've heard the words thrown around recently about a constitutional crisis. Uh, if there were the imposition of martial law, that would truly be absolutely a fundamental core constitutional crisis. And so the only time that martial law is even theoretically possible are in times of open rebellion or in times of invasion. And that's what the Constitution provides. And it says that only Congress has the authority to suspend habeas corpus and only in the face of rebellion or invasion. And so, um, and so I, I, I want to make people aware that martial law does exist as a concept. Obviously, we have seen it in other countries. Uh, one would hope that this situation would never give, uh, would never provide for the opening of a door for the imposition of martial law here in the United States. I would hope not. Well said. A wealth of information. Edwin Walker, independent program attorney at U.S. and Texas Law Shield, and you have access to independent program attorneys like Mr. Walker when you become a member of U.S. Law Shield. Go online right now, uslawshield.com forward slash defend and join. Mr. Walker, 
Thank you so much for joining us on our webinar about coronavirus and your gun rights all across America, sir. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. And, you know, we here, we all of our lawyers here at U.S., uh, the U.S. Law Shield lawyers across the country um, are ready to stand shoulder and shoulder with the U.S. Law Shield members. Outstanding. Appreciate it. Get ready to answer those phone calls. Become a member real quick at uslawshield.com forward slash defend. Uh, a quick message. And when we come back, let's get the medical side of coronavirus. Uh, where are the hot spots? Where should you be careful? Gas pumps, credit card machines coming up next on U.S. Law Shield live webinar across America. Firearms are part of my daily life. My office is the gun range. When I'm competing, it's in a safe and controlled environment. But out in the real world, I'm vulnerable, just like okay. you. I'm exposed to the same okay. threats, and I abide by the same laws. With U.S. Law Shield, they take care of me. I know I'm protected if I ever need to defend myself, and they educate me on the legal ability to do so. And that's why my everyday carry consists of three critical items. My gun, my phone, and my U.S. Law Shield card. Training gives me peace of mind on the range, and Law Shield, well, they give me peace of mind off the range. I'm Jesse Harrison, world and national champion pistol shooter, and proud member of U.S. Law Shield. Firearms are part of my daily Thank you for joining us. I'm Sam Malone in Houston, Texas, a live webinar with U.S. Law Shield. Uh, coming up, we're going to get to the gun question. There are people who've never owned, let's say, a semi-automatic uh, firearm, and they've gone to the store. Maybe they have one. What do they need to know? Can you just waltz out of the gun shop because it's a, quote, state of emergency without a license to carry and things like that? We'll get to that in the next segment. But in the meantime, let's get the medical point of view from uh, Dr. Hemisphere, part of the U.S. Law Shield family. Let's talk hot spots and let's try not to get sick out there. Check it out. Good evening. Tonight we're going to be speaking about coronavirus and some things that you may not have thought about that you can do to keep both yourself and your family safe. Now we all know about the concepts that the government has put out. Wash your hands frequently. Keep six feet apart. Concept of social distancing. But why is that six-foot barrier so important? Well, you have to think about the fact that if somebody is infected with a virus, but they're not yet symptomatic, so they have no signs of the virus, what's happening? When you exhale, you exhale moisture. That moisture can contain the virus. So if you're closer than six feet, if you inhale the air that somebody else has just exhaled, you can be inhaling their uh, moisture droplets that contain the virus, and then you become infected. The virus grows, you go to visit your family, your elderly parents, somebody that has an underlying medical condition, you exhale, they breathe it in, now they're infected. So that's how this is spreading so quickly. And that's why maintaining six feet between everybody is so important. And so you, you don't inhale somebody else's um, moisture that they have breathed out that may contain uh, the virus. So six feet apart. Avoid social contact, no shaking hands, things like that. Now the other one that's very important is hand washing. And nobody really knows how to wash their hands well. We all kind of put a little soap on, splash around, and dry off, and that's it. So let me show you a variation of how surgeons wash their hands. And this is a great technique. It gets everything that needs to be done on a hand clean. The fronts, the backs, in between the fingers, the fingernails. It only takes about 20 seconds to do this, but it works incredibly well. So let me show you the way that we like to do it as surgeons, and this is a variation of that way. But basically, we start out with a lot of soap on each hand, and you start out rubbing your palms together, and then I get the back of each hand. After that, I want to get each thumb and each finger individually and go through and do this on both hands. And then when I'm done with that, I want to get the web spaces sort of like this, and get in between the web spaces. And then finally, try to get up underneath my nails so I scrub each hand. And then as the very last one, I just kind of go back over the fronts and backs of each palm, rinse everything off very well, dry them off, and I'm done with the hand washing. And that's the best way to do it. But it's the same routine, it's lots of soap, 
and just getting into the habit of doing it. It doesn't take very long. It's only about 20 seconds, as you can see, but that's all it takes. Now that we understand the importance of staying six feet away, and we know how to do proper hand washing, let's think about some other areas that we probably don't normally think about that could potentially contaminate our hands. So how do we protect ourselves using credit cards, cell phones, and pumping gas? Let's see if we can find some answers to those questions. How do you not contaminate yourself at a gas pump? The easiest way to do this is to use the gas station app. And BP and Shell, and those are the ones that I use so I can talk about those, but I suspect that all gas companies have the same uh, capabilities in their apps. Basically, you create an account, link a credit card. So when I pull into a gas station, the BP app tells me what gas station I'm at because of the GPS in my cell phone. and then asks me to identify the pump. So I put in pump number 6 or 8 or 10, whatever pump I'm at. I then get a message saying the pump is being unlocked. The pump is unlocked. Pump gas. Then I put a glove on my non-dominant hand, use the gloved hand to pump the gas and put the handle back. At that point, I have a gloved hand and if it's a disposable throw it away, get back in my car, use some Purell, and drive off. If it's a reusable glove, then I take Purell, squirt in the glove, really wash that glove and wash my hand with Purell. Then I take the glove off, drop it on the driver's mat, floor mat, get in the car, put more Purell in both hands, wash both my hands, and then drive off. It's a very easy way to get gas, not worry about contaminating your credit card and the uh, card reader or contaminating your wallet or even having to contaminate both hands. So it's a very nice thing to do. I'd look at using gas apps for this purpose. The goal is to have clean spaces, not only in your house but also in your car. So at the end of the day, I take wipes and wipe down anything that my hands have touched in the car. Or if I've had packages in the car where I put them on the seat, I wipe the seats down with some sort of disinfectant wipe. So it may be the door handles, the seats, the steering wheel, the gear shift knob, uh, all those sorts of things, radio controls and so forth, and wipe them down. I also take disinfectant spray, spray the gas pedals and also spray the driver's side mat or any mat where shoes have touched. And then I let those things dry overnight. If there are any disposable gloves in the car that I've used and have not yet taken care of, I take those out, spray them down with Lysol, and then hang them up and let them dry overnight. And then the next morning, put the disposable gloves back in the car in case I need them again. Basically, what I'm trying to do is create a clean space inside the car when I'm out and about so that there's a minimal risk of contamination as long as I'm inside the car. Well, the most obvious question is how do we shoot? Because we all enjoy that. Well, if you have access to an outdoor range, by all means use it. But remember, the workbenches are probably contaminated, so clean that surface. For those of us that have to use an indoor range, and that's most of us, if I had to make a guess, this becomes more of a problem. Because once you get to an indoor range, that's when people congregate, the six-foot rule goes out the window, plus to get into the range, use the target controls and target clips, multiple people are touching those things, so the possibility of contamination is extremely high. Without a doubt, the safest thing to do is to just use gloves. But be aware of the fact that anything that you put your weapon systems on, your bags, your clothes, will probably end up being contaminated. And so you need to take those precautions when you get home. Probably a safer way to go about this, and one that you may just may not have thought of, is using an in-home laser training program, such as the CERT program, or the one that I like, iTarget. It's a great program, still lets you shoot at home in the safety of your home. It's not quite the same as going to a range, that's for sure. But on the other hand, it's a lot safer and I really don't have to worry about decontaminating anything. But the overall key to this is if you want to do an activity, think about how you can be contaminated, think about how you can prevent the contamination, and then proceed accordingly. Because we don't want to get the virus and give it to any of our loved ones or anyone else. Excellent. Dr. Rick, thank you very much. Remember folks, all that you're learning tonight are from great minds, whether it be medical and of course legal, what are you waiting for? Join U.S. Law Shield right now, or wait till we're finished. Uh, do it later today or tonight at your convenience, but become part of the family so you can have access 24 seven 
to an attorney answered hotline with the independent program attorneys at U.S. Law Shield. Go online, uslawshield.com forward slash defend. Let me get to our next independent program attorney. Uh, I've known her a long time. She is an encyclopedia of gun law knowledge. Say hi to Emily Taylor. Emily, welcome to our, our webinar across America. Hi, Sam. It's great to see you. Good to have you. Um, there has been a big run on guns at gun stores, especially here in Texas. I every morning get an email from a gun store, gun range. Uh, we're out of this semi-automatic or that, or we're only going to sell one box of ammo. Uh, so there's a lot of people who probably never owned one, but feel it's important to have one for their safety and security. Um, let's start on the top. If we are under quote a state of emergency or a lockdown, do the gun laws change? If I were to buy a gun at a gun store. Well, in most places, they're not going to change. Um, now, keep in mind that that might vary state by state. There are some states who may say, because you're under a state of emergency, we're going to restrict certain rights. Most states don't do that. Certainly here in Texas, we do not. Um, but of course, during these um, states of emergency, we have... Um, broad executive power that's been granted to state government, local governments. Again, luckily in Texas here, we're safe, but there are some states that might not be as friendly. Somebody walking into a gun store and going, oh, state of emergency. I don't need a license to carry. I don't, you know, they used to be called CHL, concealed handgun license. Now they're called license to carry. Um, <laughs> please let them know, especially here in Texas, uh, just because it's a state emergency, you just can't put that gun in your belt or your holster and go outside. Yeah, that's right. So um, you should assume that the laws that applied before the state of emergency were declared still apply, but double check that assumption. So, for example, uh, in Texas, in most states, you don't need um, any special licensing to go purchase a gun. You walk into the gun store, you make your purchase, you walk directly en route to your car. We have our very specific um, ways that you can transport that weapon home, you can transport that weapon um, lawfully and legally. But if you live in a state, um, let's say like um, Illinois, like New York, the ones that require purchase uh, licenses to purchase just to own and possess, assume that that still remains the state of the law and make sure that you're following that law. Now, of course, the downside here is uh, with the governments in a, you know, virtual panic, uh, if you have to apply for a license to purchase, are you going to get that license with the governments dealing with everything else? Your guess is as good as mine, but I think we probably know the answer to that. And another thing, uh, there's a huge backlog of just doing background checks. So I think if you bought a gun today, Emily, uh, you're not going to get it today or tomorrow, whatever. I've seen some, there are 15 and 30 day backups on the federal background check. So you get it today, you might get it next month. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We're hearing that from gun stores all over that Nix is telling them, you know, you've got until April 15th or we're giving you 30 days um, because we are so backlogged. If your state allows private sales like here in Texas, we do now is a great time to engage in that private sale, assuming you're not violating your city or county um, lockdown order by doing so. Emily Taylor, independent program attorney, coronavirus, your gun rights and the laws you must know. Uh, I've got some questions and then we'll take a break and it's your questions. Emily, we're seeing in the news and you're an independent program attorney, I'm sure you've seen these, of uh, a guy threatening to sneeze on people at a supermarket and he ends up getting arrested and there could be some, believe it or not, terrorist and terroristic threat charges. Um, walk us through that. I didn't think it would be that serious if you go, nobody move or I'm going to cough. Sure. Well, so, you know, we have, um, we have standards of what is, um, and of course, and, and I'll, I'll start, I'll back it up and start this way. This all varies state by state. 
Um, there are laws that criminalize uh, always in every state threatening to do harm to someone. There are laws that criminalize um, unwanted touchings, right? Spitting on someone is criminalized in almost every state. So these things have always existed. Now the problem becomes here, um, they are likely to scare people a lot more when we're talking about this disease that is, um, you know, of course, potentially deadly for um, many segments of the population who um, are, you know, maybe immunocompromised or older or what have you. And so, yes, um, this is something, it's not something to joke about. Uh, you can imagine that, you know, perhaps if you had uh, committed what we call here in Texas, a class C assault, which is an offensive touching. Um, if you had committed that before, uh, maybe you wouldn't be arrested. You might just be issued a citation. Maybe the police would just tell you to go your separate ways. Whereas now they're going to take it much more seriously. You also, if you're engaging in that activity, need to understand that you are panicking people. And even though our force and deadly force laws across the country do not change as a result of this virus, um, you know, the likelihood, particularly in a place uh, like Texas, that you end up getting yourself shot, um, you know, that person who shot you is still going to be charged with murder, but you have, uh, why have you put yourself in that situation to begin with? So again, it's it, the same scenario as the carry laws, the gun stores, the law has likely not changed in your state, um, but this is a situation in which you really don't want to play with the consequences. And I'm just going to ask it. I mean, you know, I'm silly and goofy sometimes. Emily Taylor is an independent program attorney. But can deadly force be used if someone sneezes directly on you? I'm, I'm, and we're going to start obviously in the state of Texas. But it's something I've got to ask because it's so goofy. You're the attorney. Walk me through this. Sure. And, and you know, uh, you know, we're, we're laughing a little bit here, but it's actually a question that's come up quite a bit. Um, hard and fast. No, do not use deadly force against someone who sneezes on you, who coughs on you. Um, the, again, the deadly force laws have not changed. So here's what um, here's what you should think about is of course your actions are going to be judged on a reasonableness standard and that's for use of force like displaying a weapon or maybe shoving someone or punching someone up to deadly force you must be reasonable and so um, if someone coughs on you and you shove them away well that was a lot less reasonable a month ago than it is today and so your actions will be judged accordingly based upon all the circumstances, and of course, this is a very important one. Now, that being said, do not use deadly force against someone who you simply believe to be sick in public. Um, not only is that um, something that is going to uh, just be terrible for your legal future, but I cannot stress enough how much you do not want to be in a jail right now. Those places are not sanitized. They're packed with people. Everyone should be playing it as safe as humanly possible with their firearms, with everything right now, because the last place you want to be is in a jail cell. You can say that twice and be right both times. Emily Taylor, independent program attorney. Uh, you're watching us on U.S. Law Shield live across America about coronavirus. Your rights and the laws, you really have to know. We're very serious here about uh, people breaking into your home, coming after your personal property. I'm going to make it the uh, the subject is not a, uh, they're not stealing a, a, a jewelry or a flat screen TV. It's toilet paper. In the state, I know, but in the state of Texas, Emily, if someone were to break in, someone were to steal, and you might think, oh, they might be after my guns or my watches and they're after toilet paper. In Texas, does it matter? I know because there's a run on toilet paper. Does it matter what the item is? that someone's trying to steal from your castle, from your domicile? So I guess I'll, I'll tackle this two ways. The first is in the castle situation you've brought up. In Texas, and for many places that have castle doctrine laws, this will be similar, but again, check your state law because it varies state by state, even if your state has the castle doctrine. In Texas, all it takes is someone forcefully and unlawfully entering your castle for you to be presumed reasonable in your use of deadly force against them, which means it doesn't matter what they're there to steal. Um, 
period, bar none. Once they attempt that forceful and unlawful entry, which just means they don't have any right to be there, and it means they are doing something to get in. So it's a very easy standard. You're presumed reasonable in your use of deadly force. So that's number one. And again, check your state law if you're outside of the state of Texas. Now, the other thing to think about is um, property generally, toilet paper generally. Uh, do we have some sort of category of super property or um, property distinctions? And in Texas, the answer is no. So let's say, hypothetically, I have got a 12-pack of Charmin sitting on top of my car in my driveway. And I've just carried some other stuff into the house. And I'm coming back out and I see someone running away with my toilet paper. Um, now, it's not worth a whole lot of money to begin with, although it's you know extra special right now because there's a bit of a run on it. The same rules apply today as they would have applied several months ago. If you shoot someone running away with toilet paper, you are going to be um, in, you're going to have a hard time here in Texas, even though were this to happen at nighttime, the law actually gives you some allowance for using deadly force against someone fleeing with your property. You don't want to be standing there in front of a jury, having your lawyer argue that you did the right thing when you took a life over a 12 pack of Charmin. It is just not a situation that you want to be in. And they're going to have to decide that you were reasonable, that you did the right thing. And it's a tough, tough road. I can only imagine. Uh, one more question uh, from me, and then we'll take a quick break and get to your questions. I'm with Emily Taylor, independent program attorney, U.S. Law Shield. I'm a member. You have access. You get a 24-7 attorney answered hotline when you join uslawshield.com forward slash defend. Um, quick, for, uh, a quick list of or quick no-nos for all the new gun owners out there, because as we said, there was a gun run and people who have never owned ran to the stores and depleted the stock of semi-automatics and such. Um, quick no-nos for brand new gun owners. Let's just start with drinking and let's touch base on use of a controlled substance while you're in possession of your brand new Glock or Beretta? Yeah, absolutely. So this is something that, again, varies state by state. There are some states that say um, if you have any alcohol in your system, that's unlawful for you to have your weapon on you. There are some states like Texas uses a .08 standard, same as for driving. Some states use a .05 standard. Um, you know, Texas also has a loss of mental or physical faculty standard, which would cover your controlled substances. Um, some states will tell you to get rip roaring drunk as long as you're doing the right thing with your weapon. They don't care. Um, now, another thing to think about is what if I'm drinking in my own home um, in Texas? That's a completely different story. In lots of states, it is the same. They will tell you that you must, if you're going to be in possession of that weapon, not be drunk in your own home. Here's the important thing, though, and the thing that I want people to think about if they are new gun owners. If you're a new gun owner, you have not had very much training, perhaps little to no training, and you are going to rely upon that firearm to defend yourself and your family, which means um, you should not be in the scenario where you are intoxicated, inebriated, altered at all, because you are already at a disadvantage for not having the training. So um, again, new gun owners, you should check your state law on intoxication, on inebriation. However, um, gosh, you know, it's you've you've got a lot of training disadvantage to catch up on once uh, once we can all get out and about again. So be ultra cautious. Excellent. Uh, Emily Taylor, independent program attorney with U.S. Law Shield. Uh, let's take a quick break and then we'll get to your questions from tonight and some great questions from previous events. I'm Sam Malone, your host in Houston, Texas. You're watching our webinar, U.S. Law Shield, Coronavirus and Your Gun Rights, next. Even when you follow four rules for firearm safety, accidents can still happen. Whether it's out on the range, cleaning your gun, or hunting, things can always go wrong. Get certified today with our first aid for gunshot wounds course through the U.S. Law Shield Two-Way Institute. Your life may depend on it. Welcome back. 
Let's get to it. Now uh, we're going to rapid fire uh, through questions to our independent program attorney, Emily Taylor, um, about our gun rights with coronavirus and the states of emergencies and the, quote, lockdowns and the uh, gun stores aren't allowed to be open in L.A. County or mayor saying no gun sales. So here we go from Colette. Um, are we still allowed to carry concealed during this time? And can any time can officials tell us that we can't, Emily? Interestingly, um, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, the federal government passed law that says they can't disarm you. The federal government can't disarm you because a state of emergency has been declared. Some states have similar, similar laws, some states do not. I can tell you, uh, Colette, if you are here in Texas, um, they cannot disarm you simply because a state of emergency has been declared. Same rules apply. You could still be detained, temporarily disarmed, just like before. Um, you know, we have lots of different health and safety code um, uh, regulations that can be enacted here in Texas. But for the most part, your carry rights are going to be safe. Excellent. Tristan asks, is the state, and we'll start in Texas, is the state allowed to ban the sale of firearms during this state of emergency, like I said, we saw it in uh, L.A. County when the sheriff said we're shutting down gun stores. We've seen uh, the mayor of New Orleans want to do this. Emily, we'll start with uh, the great state of Texas. Yeah, so the, the issue really boils down to are gun stores an essential business once we put in these lockdowns, these stay home orders, et cetera? Um, and in some of these orders, the answer is definitively yes, because the orders actually include and define gun stores as essential businesses, which makes perfect sense. Um, your Second Amendment right remains unchanged, we hope. If you need it to hunt, you need to feed your family, you need that ammunition, you need those weapons, that's wonderful. That is essential. You should be able to get them. Now, of course, some places, California, places like that, um, don't think that this is essential. Now, it really is going to be, um, it's something we don't have time to litigate in the moment. Um, here in Texas, we're seeing that um, we're not seeing a lot of challenges to the gun stores that stay open. Um, in fact, in Austin, even, which is probably the worst part of Texas for guns, um, we're seeing that even though people are calling the police on some of the Austin gun stores, the police are saying, no, 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 these are essential businesses right now. Wow. It will vary state by state based on your order. Gosh, that is scary. Um, or let me ask you this, and this didn't come to my mind, but it came to Mark's and his question. Is there a limit during a, quote, state of emergency? Is there a limit on how much ammo I can buy? Or is there a limit on how much I can store in my house? Emily. Well, it's probably going to be dependent on what your state said before the state of emergency. So if Mark is in Texas, um, Mark, we're kindred spirits. I like your question. Uh, the answer is no, there's no limit on ammunition. There are limits on black powder. Um, they can be regulated at 25 pounds on the city level, 50 pounds on the county level. But ammunition, no. There are some states that are going to regulate your ammunition, not only how much you can buy, but how much you can store check your state law just to be sure. Uh, Emily, let's see, this is from Nick, uh, who's sending his question. With government facilities closed and they can't get your LTC, which is licensed to carry, updated or renewed, or even get it in time, can you carry with an old LTC? Or can you carry without an LTC? Because, hey, it's an emergency. Emily Taylor. Assume not. Assume the laws remain unchanged. Um, so in many states, that means that, you know, maybe you can still open carry without a license. That's not the case here in Texas. But in many states, that is the case um, here in Texas. If you don't have that license in your possession or if that license is expired, you cannot carry. Uh, let's get to self-defense. Ken says, do I have the right to brandish a pistol if someone attempts to steal items from my grocery cart? You kind of touched on that in the last segment, but go ahead, give us the Reader's Digest version. Um, no, Ken, I would be very, very cautious with that. Again, um, I say no as a practical point. The law, again, has not changed. So when someone is committing a theft, 
Um, now, if you've already paid for those groceries, that's the theft from you. If you have not paid for them yet, that's the theft from the grocery store, and you, sh you um, should be even more cautious in that situation. But just because the law says you might be able to use force against a theft here in Texas, um, it is just we recommend against it because you don't get any presumptions of reasonableness for a simple theft here in Texas. Um, it's an uphill battle in front of your jury because they're starting from essentially ground zero to decide that you're reasonable. They're not instructed to presume you reasonable, which is the case in a lot of personal defense crimes here in the Castle Doctrine. So um, can even if the black letter of the law might suggest that's a lawful activity, I highly recommend against it again. Do you want to risk a jail cell for um, a box of macaroni? Probably not. <laughs> what kind of macaroni? <laughs> <laughs> and one more real quick, because I know you're busy. Everyone, don't forget, I'm going to get one more question. But when you become a member of U.S. Law Shield uh, League, you know, it's the, it's the legal defense for your self-defense. You'll have access to independent program attorneys like Emily. Uh, one more uh, Mark says, what is the appropriate response if two or more people are in a physical altercation and I am carrying? So two people fighting in the parking lot, maybe over toilet paper. Uh, Emily, Mark has his, uh, let's say, uh, his Glock 21. What should he do? Yeah, in most states, you're not under affirmative duty to step into a situation like that even if you're there with your carry weapon and could help, um, you are, again, in almost every state that I know of, not under any affirmative duty to put yourself into harm's way to help others to break it up. Um, you know, should you choose to do so? Uh, perhaps. Again, it's something I recommend against, especially in this time. What if you've misinterpreted the situation? What if you have... Um, a shot, you fire a shot, it's stray, you hit someone else, you hit a car, you're deemed reckless, which in Texas will get you arrested for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon by means of recklessness. It is not worth it unless you absolutely have to. I hate to tell you not to step in and defend your fellow man, but um, it, it, it's, it's a tough call right now, tougher than ever. Great questions. U.S. Law Shield, the nation's leading legal defense for self-defense you're hearing from the best. Uh, Emily Taylor is one of the independent program attorneys who can answer your questions. 24-7, um, attorney answered hotline, standing by when you become a member. Uh, I'll give you the website one more time. Emily, thank you for joining us on our webinar across America about gun rights. You need to know, you must know. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sam. Everyone else, uh, as we get ready to wrap up this program will loop again if you joined us halfway and you want to get the answers to your questions. Uh, and don't forget to become part of the U.S. Law Shield family. Visit their website right now, uslawshield.com forward slash defend and join. Thank you for watching. In Houston, Texas, I'm Sam Malone.